see as we learn more and then the algorithm will get more complicated and the stuff will be naturally somewhat more complicated, right? Okay, so enjoy it as long as it's easy. Hopefully by attending class and all that, it will remain easy all the way through, all right? Okay, so picking up from last time, we talked about um, a geometric method to find basic solutions that is feasible, meaning non-negative. So we talked about the method, and let's take the example and complete it. Is that big enough? This is a better board than the other room. Hmm? OK, so um, let me repeat the example. x1, 1, 0. Two, one, three, x four, two, one, no, x three, sorry. Is that right? So that's the example. We call these vectors V one, V two, V three. V4, and this we call B. So last time, our a general observation or general rule would be we wanted to um, express B as a linear combination of two of them if I choose two of them to be the basic variable, right? Because the non-basic variables will set them to be 0 in the basic solution. So the question will be, can I express B as non-negative linear combination of two of these variables. Is that right? So the general rule we had last time will be, so in general, if I shall have two vectors, any, let's say, v1, v2, this is general, not to that problem, then um, the comb formed by these two vector, so the directions are the only thing that matters here, not the length. Because you can multiply v1 by any number and v2 by any number, stretch it longer or shorter. So the comb formed by these two vectors should contain any vector that b can stay such that b is a non-negative linear combination of the other two. Is this clear to all of us? That's the, the key idea, right? So once you have that in your hand, then I can basically check any pair of these with this geometric rule to figure out if I can use x1, x2, or x2, x3, any combination. Okay, So let's um, sketch these four vectors um, to see what we have. So, so in a two-dimensional place, let's don't draw the coordinate line. It confuses. Let's say that's the origin. Which direction will, be, will v1 be pointing at? 1, 0, that will be the horizontal direction. Is that clear? So it's the direction that matters. So that will be v1. What about v2? So you take one unit horizontal, then you take three unit vertical up. Is that right? So let's say one unit here, one, two, three unit here, I end up here, so I will be in this direction. That will be my V2. It's the direction that matters, okay? And what about V3? I will take two units horizontal and one unit up. Is that right? So two unit horizontal, one unit up will be somewhere in that direction. So pointing that, so that's my V3. And then V4, one unit horizontal, eight units vertical. So it'll be very, very vertical, quite steep with slope eight. So that's V4. And where is the B vector? Let me put the B vector with color. So B vector, six units horizontal, three units vertical up. Do you see that it's the same as I get rid of the multiple, the common multiple? 
it's the same as two units up, uh, two units horizontal, one unit up. Is that right? So it actually points in the same direction as V3. Do we see? So let me just draw the V like that. Okay, make it a bit longer. That's the B direction. Okay, so now we can answer the questions we um, had last time. So the question is, can x, did we check x1 and x2? Can x1, x2 be used as basic variable? Not only that, but we'll give a feasible basic solution. That was the underlying thing we we're trying to search, right? So what do you think? Where is V1? V1 is here, and V2 is here. Is the B lying in a good comb? <laughs> do we see? So what will be the comb formed by V1 and V2? There will be all these directions in between them. Is that right? And B is in there. Is that right? So that's clearly so. B is in the cone. So which means um, x1, x2 as basic variable will give a, a good, meaning feasible, basic solution. OK? Is it clear? OK. So let's ask some other questions. Say, now, um, how about I want to choose um, x2 and x4? Can, they be, can that be good? Would that be a good choice? What do you think? So where is V2, where is V4? It's here, V2 and V4, right? What will be the good comb formed by those two vectors? It will be the smaller angle they form, is that right? So it will be here. Is my B vector in it? No, so that can't be, is that right? So your answer will be no. Because you can go ahead and try it, this will give a non-feasible basic solution. Right? Because B lies outside the cone. So you can't express it as a non-negative linear combination. Okay. So is that clear? And now, for this example, actually, there is something quite interesting. Probably put it in on purpose. So um, we observe that B is in the same direction as V3. Those two vectors are parallel. Is that right? Don't you wonder? What does that mean? What trouble would that cause or whatever? Is it good or not? Mm -hmm. So here's an observation. We observe that the B vector is parallel to V3. So what does it do? So in particular, I want to ask the following question. So when I choose the set of basic variables, if V3 is one of them and it's paired with some other variable, can that be a good choice? And if that is good, what's a, what special thing will happen here, <coughs> right? So can x2 be a, a choice of a basic variable? OK, and then I want to know what's special here. OK, so let's say, say um, I want to choose um, x1 and x3 as basic variable.
what will happen if I do that. So I want to express B as a linear combination of V1 and V3. Is that right? Mm -hmm. You want to comment? Yeah. So the one that is not x3, be it x1 or any other guy you choose, must take value 0. Is that right? Why? Well, we see that b now exactly equals to um, 3 times v3. And that's it, right? It equals to. So anything you add on top must be 0. Now, if you choose x1, then it has to be 0. If you pair x3 with x2, then x2 must be 0. Is that clear to us? Mm -hmm. So this will give you x3 equals to 3, but x1 must be 0. All right? If that is your choice. So here we get a basic solution. So if that is a choice, the um, associated basic solution will be the following. So these two are the basic variables, or the other are non-basic. They are all set to be 0. Uh -huh. So um, I will have um, x1 equals to 0, x3 equals to 3. These are the basic ones. And I have x2 equals to x4. Is that what I have? They are 0, and these are non-basic. So what is strange here? So usually the non-basic variables are 0, right? Basic variables equal to the right-hand side of the equation. Usually they're non-zero. But in this case, x1 equals to 0 in the basic solution as a basic variable. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a disguising itself as a non-basic variable, right? It takes the same value as all the others. Okay. And this is a, a special case. So one of the basic variables equals to 0. That is not such a nice thing. So let me write it down to emphasize that this is actually quite important. Okay. So if so here's an example, one basic variable equal to 0. But if you have a big system, it could happen that several of them equals to 0 in a basic solution, right? It could happen, OK? So now I say if some basic variables, OK, it could be plural, mm -hmm, is 0 in a basic solution, and then we call this solution has a name. It's a special one. It's called to be degenerate. OK, so that's the definition, the new term. So. And now later on, we will see that this is actually quite a, it's a troublemaker, but that comes later. Later on, we'll learn what trouble it causes and possibly how to deal with that. All right. So is it clear? If I give you the system of the constraint, would you be able to, I mean, with only two constraints, would you be able to find a good choice for the um, basic variables using this geometric method? There will be a homework problem in that direction for you in homework three. All right. So you can practice on that. OK. All right, now we need to go back to um, something actually uh, we had on the board last time, then I, I will repeat it. Okay. So all this we're doing is to put the constraint in the canonical form. And we s observed already last time that if I manage to put it in a canonical form using certain basic variables, then you can express the basic variables 
in terms of the non-basic ones, right? So that is an observation that we had. So let's focus a little bit on that. Okay, so if I am in canonical form after all that work, so one can express basic variables in terms of the non-basic ones. Okay. So I will put down something that you had on your notes from last class. Um, so um, did I label it? I don't know if I labeled it. Okay, so so let's say from last class, I'll pull out some um, I'll repeat some stuff here. So we had the system, let me put x1 plus 5 over 8, x2 plus, no, not that one. That one was the later one. Let's take the one that we set up. And we did one step of pivoting. The first canonical form that we ran into with nicer coefficients. The first one. OK? So we did the pivoting in using x1 x2 as basic va uh, variables, pivoted, and we have the following, x1 and x2, kind of a, in a diagonal form here, 5 over 3. You have all these in your notes. I just have to repeat. Eight over three. Okay. So this is now in canonical form. And you see that I can express x1 in terms of x3 and x4 by moving this to the right hand side, and these are non basic variables, right? And x2 can be expressed as x3 and x4, which are non basic variables. So let me write one more step. So x1. Just want to point this out. This is a three, five over three, x four, and x two is one minus one over three, x three minus. So that was, um, I want to point out, so okay, so we can express all the basic variables in terms of the non-basic ones in the constraint. So if this constraint shall be part of a linear programming problem, that's what we want to go back to. Okay. So if this is a linear programming problem. So in a linear programming problem, I have this as my constraint, and I have some um, objective function, right? OK, so for this one, let's say the objective function is some function f depending on x1, x2, x3, and x4, for example. And then I found out that the basic variables, x1 and x2, can be expressed in terms of x3 and x4. Then I can plug these two expressions in, and I can eliminate that dependence. And in the end, your objective function will depend only on the non-basic variable. I can write it like that. Do we see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one can use that to eliminate x1 and x2, meaning the basic variables. Okay. So we just take um, one kind of a silly um, example. Okay, 
So let's take an example. Okay, so um, this constraint is called 1. Is that right? And let's say I have the following problem. Minimize. Mm -hmm. um, C equals to x1 minus x2 plus 2x3 minus 5x4. So that's my objective function. And uh, subject to the constraint is exactly this set, uh, this equation set number 2, and plus the um, non-negativity. Okay, so we have this linear programming. And then I did the work, I wrote the constraint in this canonical form, and also I knew that's a good one, it gives me feasible um, basic solutions. Once I've done that, I see that the, this function here, the objective function here, inside, I can eliminate x1 and x2, right? By using this relation. I can simply plug it in, okay? So that's the example I want to take. So let me write it here. Okay. So eliminate x1 and x2 in the expression for z. So if I do that, I'll have the following z will equal to x1. I'll replace it. That's x1. And then minus, I have x2. And I have x3 turn, x4 turn. Is that right? So x1, x2 disappeared. It's, now it's just manipulation. OK. And uh, clean it up. I see I can just write it as linear function of x1, x3, and x4. No, actually, an affine function. And we get a constant here. Okay, but the point is, the basic variables are not there. I can write it only using the non-basic variable. Okay, so this now gives me actually a very important form that we will even name. Now this gives the following um, linear programming. I mean, or for the same linear programming problem, but now it's in this form. So I will write out, so minimize mm -hmm. C equals to here. This is just copying. Mm -hmm. Subject to. OK. Now I have the constraint in the canonical form, x1. Okay. And then non negative assumption. Okay, so now this problem here, I will I will block it. It's just the initial linear programming, but we manipulated and put it in a special form. Is that right? This one is actually a, in a very good form, it's a, a starting point of the simplex method, which we'll eventually learn. But you need to start from something like this. And it has a name. Let's throw in this name. So if you manage to write your problem like this, then it's the same name, canonical form, but this is the canonical form 
of the linear program. Not only the constraint, but for the linear programming problem. Okay? And this is kind of important. So what I will do now will be um, writing this out as a formal definition and specify all the conditions in here. Okay? So it's kind of important. Okay. All right, so let's get into this formal definition. I want to define a linear programming problem to be canonical. So, so of course, this is in a standard form, right? So the standard LP is in canonical one, so that's my definition, okay? And then if you write it in the canonical form, you, ha you would have a set of basic variables, so I will specify with a set of basic variables. Mm -hmm. If all the followings are true, okay? So there are three conditions I must have. So first, now the system of the constraint here, that's the system for the constraint, must be in canonical form. This we defined early, right? So this is in canonical form with these two basic variables, okay? And the same basic variable, okay? So the system of the constraints is in canonical form, okay, with the same basic variables. So these are the basic variables that you define. And then there is something more, and that is not enough because we want to have a feasible basic solution to start with. That must be satisfied also, okay? So you're right. Choosing this canonical form with that choice of basic variable, the um, associated, the corresponding um, basic solution has to be feasible. Otherwise, it's not good. Okay? That is actually a quite a big deal, okay? It's not so easy, as you see already. We even have a graphic method to find that for some simple problems, okay? And also, um, the objective function here is expressed only in terms of the non-basic variables. We don't have basic variables appearing here, okay? That form is what we want, okay? So, this objective function Okay. This is expressed only using non basic variables. Okay. okay. So for some problems, for the example we have seen so far, we managed to um, rewrite a, the linear programming problem into a, the canonical form, right? So this is a, a I, will, I will tell you this later on, is the starting point of the famous simplex method. Okay. So is it clear? this definition here? Mm -hmm. okay. And as I said, that this is a big deal, making it feasible. It's not so easy. Okay. And now we'll start talking about um, simplex method. So that's chapter 3.3. .3. Mm -hmm. So let me put it down.
Okay. We will not learn the whole lecture today. We will just have an introduction to, to see this method, kind of get an idea of what to do. So what I will be doing will be on going through an example, not too complicated, with the fewer constraints, and try to solve it, okay? And then along the way, realize that what algorithm I can actually apply. And then in the end, we will summarize and design something that can be used in a general setting, all right? Okay, so, so this will be just going through an example. It will take a long time. I don't think we'll finish it today. It will be like to be continued, right? So let's get into that. Okay, so let's say I have a, um, um, a standard form. So consider a linear programming. We start from standard form. So I want to practice the graphic method also. Okay, so minimize the following. Um, so, okay, so negative 4, x1, x2, plus x2, plus x3, 7x4, 3x5, z. So that's what I want to minimize, okay? Let's call that star. And the uh, constraints. So that's the first one. I have two constraints. Okay. So I call this equation one, equation two. So I have five variables, and they all have to be um, non-negative. So let's attempt to solve this, right? And see what happens along the way. Let's try to solve it. So first, we see that um, here, the constraint, the system for the constraint is not in a canonical form. And I, I would like to get some basic solutions and to see if it's feasible, is that right? So my first step is I want to put this constraint in the canonical form, actually in the end I want to write the whole LP in the, in the canonical form following this definition. But let's start with the constraint. So put the constraints in canonical form. So not only it shall be in canonical form, I also want the associate feasible solution, uh, basic solution to be feasible. Is that right? Um, so my choice would be I need to select two basic variables, and then I perform the pivoting process that we have learned, and in the end get a basic solution. And I hope that's feasible. Is that right? So choice. So we need to select basic variables, okay, and then perform pivoting. So you know, there's quite something to do. And in the end, I want to reach a feasible basic solution, okay? So this word is included here. So for this specific problem, we know how to do that because we have only two equations. We just learned this graphic method. And we can apply it and find out which combination of, the, the, of two vectors can give me a, physic, a feasible basic solution. But in general, if you shall have a, a big system with many variables and many constraints and equations, that is not such an easy thing to find. Right, so I just want to point out that this one here, what I have here, 
actually is a, a major difficulty. Okay? It's not a piece of cake. It takes quite some work to get that starting point. Okay? So just keep that in mind. But right now, we have our graphic method. Would we, would we like to try that, the one we just learned, to see um, if I can um, find it? So let's write the constraint using the vector form. x1, what will I have? Negative 6, 3 x2 will be 0, 1. x3, what vector do I have? 1, negative 1. And x4, what would I have? Negative 2 and 8. And uh, x5, um, 2, 1. And the right-hand side, 6, 9. Is that right? So let's just call these variables. Give them a name. It's easier to refer back to them. OK. So looking at my constraint, the system, I see that um, x2 is already conveniently pivoted in equation 2. So probably I would like to keep that, because that saves some work. Is that right? So I, would, so I would like to figure out, can I use x2 combined with one other variable as a good choice of basic variables? Would that be OK? So let's see. So what is the direction for v2? v2 is 0, 1, meaning it will point vertically up. Is that right? So this will be v2. And let's put the b vector in red. So what will be the b vector? It's 6 and 9. So it's like 2 units horizontal, 3 units up. It's almost like slope 1, but a little bit bigger slope. So that's the b. So what other variable, or what other vector can I choose so I can have a non-negative linear combination for b? So um, do you think v1 would work? Yep or no? Which direction will v1 point at? x is negative, so I will go negative here and then positive. So v1 will be some direction like that. Would that work? No. If v1 is like this, the cone they form is here and b is outside. Is that right? Okay. What about v3 then, if v1 is out of the question? v3, which direction does it point at? One unit up, uh, horizontal, one unit down, right? It's a negative one. So it's pointing like with slope negative one going down. That's my V3. Would that be good? So we see B is contained in this cone. Is that right? So that's a good choice. OK, so let's, let's be happy and uh, choose that. OK, so first I observe x2 is already is ready in equation 2. So I'm going to keep that. And then I find out that I can use x3. x3 is a good choice. So OK. So x3, what I will do, I will pivot it in, in the first equation. OK? So this is already ready. And then I want to pivot that guy there. So what does it mean? I need to make the coefficient 1 here, which is done. And then I need to eliminate that x3. Is that right? So I just add equation 1 on top of equation 2 and replace the equation 2. And that 3 will be, x3 will be gone. Do we see that? OK. So it's very simple. So take the second equation now is replaced by the first equation and add it on top of the second equation. Is that OK? OK. So. Um, let me write out. So in the end, I have the following constraint in the canonical form. Negative 6 x1 plus x3. Mm -hmm. This is unchanged. 
And the second equation is slightly changed. 3x1 x2 plus 6 x4 plus 3 x5 equals to 15. So let's label them equation 1 prime and equation 2 prime. So the system we have after one round of putting into canonical form. Okay? So this canonical form is with the, these two as the basic variables, right? So can we write out the basic solution right away? Are we okay? What will be the basic solution for that? Mm -hmm. What do we do with the non-basic variables? They're all set to be What do we do with the non-basic ones? x1, x4, x5, they'll be set to be 0. <coughs> right? And then x2 and x3 would take the value on the right-hand side. Is that right? x2 would take 15, and then x3 would take the value 6. Is that right? That's the associated basic solution. And uh, let's write it in this um, tuplet form as a point in the space of five dimensions. That will be this. Is that right? x1, x2, x3, x4, x5. And then we find that this is a feasible one, of course, because we made a good choice. We knew it would be feasible, right? It's non-negative. Yeah. Okay. Whoops. Okay, so that is your first step. Now I have found a good choice of basic variables and my constraints are in canonical form, and uh, so, so the last thing that remains, if I want it to be the whole problem to be in canonical form, is that the objective function shall be expressed using only non-basic variables. All right, so that's my second step. Actually, it's part two of the first step. We're just doing one of it. So I need to adjust the um, objective function. What do we mean? Well, meaning that I need to um, eliminate its dependence on the basic variable. So here would be um, x2 and x3 in it. Is that right? So as we have done in the previous example. So you see, it's in canonical form. So basically, this says x3 equals 2. You can move everything to the right-hand side, and it will be an expression of x1, x4, x5. And x4, x2 can be the same. You can put everything on the right-hand side, and it can be expressed by the non-basic variables. So in principle, I could plug these two back in here and get rid of that, right? OK, so that, that, that you can do. But what we will do here will be um, something more um, geared towards a, an algorithm form, OK? We have been doing pivoting, and we want to use that to achieve this goal, which in principle is doing the same thing. Okay, So this can be done by a pivoting process. So what you have to do, this is an equation, and you want to eliminate x2 and x3 in that equation. Is that right? 
and and that these constraints are satisfied. So what you can do, well, you can let's say I want to eliminate x two. What do I do? Well, I multiply equation in the canonical form. I multiply equation two prime by a suitable constant, and add on top so it cancels the x two. Is that clear? So it's always the pivoting process. So your code will be later on. We'll have an algorithm. Your algorithm will be just doing the pivoting, right? So let's take a step at that time. So let's say to eliminate x2, what can we do? Well, x2 is in equation 2 prime. I take equation 2 prime, and I multiply it with negative 1, and I add this on top of equation star, OK? And this becomes my. Um, star prime. Is that clear? So why do I multiply by negative 1? Is exactly this x2 will be cancelled out. Right? Okay? So if I do that, I'll have the following. Negative x1 plus, so the x2 will carry the 0 in the front. That's what I wanted and plus x3 plus x4 plus 0 x5. And that 0 is just an accident. It will be non-zero very soon. And then I have some number on the right-hand side. So what does it mean? This means now z equals to 15 plus the rest. x2 is not there in the expression. I got rid of it. Is that clear? And you can do the same thing with x2. So I can, I can try to x3, eliminate x3. Mm -hmm. So let me get some space. OK, so this is my star prime. So I go to the canonical form. I take the first equation, which contains x3. I multiply by a suitable constant. Here I see negative 1 would work. And then I add it on top, equation star prime. And I call this star double prime. Okay, I keep modifying this star equation. Okay? So if I do that, I know x3 will be gone. I'll have the following. 5x1 plus 0x2. And now I also have 0 x3. So this was my goal. I get rid of them. Plus 3x4 minus 2x5 equals to z minus 21. And that's that. Is it clear? Now we manage to rewrite the problem as it's stated here initially into a linear programming in canonical form. Is that right? Let's summarize and write all this up. This is an example in canonical form. I'm just erasing the definition, so let's put this up. Now we have this. Minimize z with the following. I'm going to write it in this following form. So I have negative 6x1 plus x3 plus negative 2x4 that's 1. And the second one is x2. OK? So these are my um, constraints. Let's label this constraint as i. And I'm going to put the objective function as the last equation here. OK? This is gearing towards a algorithm form. So 5x1. These two are basic variables. It, 
I have 0, and I have 3x4 minus 2x5 equals 2. So the right-hand side is negative 21 plus z. Okay? And of course, uh, non-negativity. So now the problem is in canonical form as a linear program. Mm -hmm. And we see that um, it's in canonical form with the basic variables x2, x3, and the corresponding associated basic solution. So what is the basic solution? We, we wrote it down earlier there. So 0, 15, 6, 0, 0. And what is the z value at this basic solution? How do you find that out? At the basic solution, what is the z value? What, what number? The number is on the board. It's already prepared. You just have to find it. So this equation contains z. Is that right? z is what we try to minimize. What's on the left-hand side? They are all non-basic variables. So they will be 0 at the basic solution. Is that right? So what will be the z value then? The negative of this guy. Is that clear? At the basic solution. OK? So and z equals to. 21 at this basic solution. OK. Is it OK, this step? That's just the first step. So it's a pretty um, long um, process. OK. Now let's take another step, or maybe just the idea for the next step. So this is actually the, the key idea of the simplex method. Let's talk a little bit about this before we um, um, before we jump into it. So simplex method. This is actually a key idea. Okay. So so what is the um, a basic solution that we have found? Basic solution is a solution that. Um, all the non-basic variables are 0, and the basic variables are non-zero. Um, this actually associates to some observation that we made earlier of the examples we saw. So the examples we saw in 2D when we draw the feasible region and we find the maximum or minimum, we found out that the maximum and minimum generically usually is found at the vertex at the boundary where the conditions are pushed to the limit. Is that right? And these points are actually the basic solutions. Okay? There, the non-basic ones are set to be 0 that you just you think that's a slack variable. It's exactly being pushed to the boundary. Okay. So assuming that observation is general, which we will prove later, then if I manage to locate one vertex on the boundary that is feasible, and then I know that the optimal will be at some other vertex points, right? So I just need to start from that point and look around and see which edge could I move to reach the next vertex so that my um, objective function can be even smaller, right? So just move from one to the other, but along the edge. Okay, so but, okay, we'll write it down in terms of what you have to do. So we will want to move to another, OK? It's important. It should remain feasible, basic or basic feasible solution, OK? And it should be better. So that gives 
smaller z. And we want to take one step. We want to just move to the neighboring one. And this means um, I could only switch one basic variable into non-basic one and bring in, just make switch between one variables. OK, so by replacing exactly, OK, it's important, one, exactly one basic variables. OK? And meaning you keep all the other basic variables. You just switch one and search among the non-basic ones to see which one I switch will give me this advantage. Is that clear? So that is the idea, but OK. Then, um, OK, let me, let me stress. Keep all the others. Okay, so I mean this process, just to carry out this process is no big deal. I can just pick another variable, think which one I want to replace, and I do the pivoting process. Is that right? So it can be done by pivoting. That is okay. But then there are two big questions remain. So let's ask these two questions. So you say you want to take one basic variable and switch with it, and you also want to get a smaller z, right? So, so to even start that, you have to make sure that what you have here is not already the minimum. Is that right? If you already are at the minimum, then you should not move away from it, and you're done, right? So how do I know that I am not at the minimum yet? I need to answer that question. Is that right? Would it be advantages if I move away or not? Okay, so um, question: So, am I at the minimum already? How do I know? Okay, once I know that, and and uh, and then this actually comes together with the other question that is, which. Um, non-basic variable I should bring in. Okay, you will see in the process. Okay, so let's look at the objective function that we have here. Here, there actually is double star, so let's see. What does it tell me? From double star, uh, star double prime, I can rewrite, I can write z equals to, um, just move everything else to the other side, 5x1 plus 3x4 minus 2x5 plus 21. So my objective function is expressed in terms of non-basic variables. And I also know all these non-basic variables cannot go to negative region. They are positive, right? OK, so let's look at all the terms on the right hand side and see if any of the terms give me hint that I could probably make things better, make a z smaller. So first this term 21, it's a number, nothing you can do about it. So let it be. Now let's look at the first term, 5x1. So you know at the basic solution, x1 equals to 0. Is that right? That gives you the value 21 for z. Could I replace x1 with other values so z become smaller? Under this constraint, x1 is bigger than 0. If I put x1 to be 5, will it make my z smaller or bigger? If I add a 5, then I get a 25. I add that on top of 21 to give my z. So it will make the z bigger, is that right? So why would I want to do that? I want to minimize z, so it doesn't make sense. OK, OK, so um, then what about x4 then? Do you think instead of taking it to be 0 at the basic solution, I take it any other value, satisfy this constraint, would that be advantages to do? 
Hmm? What do we think? No, we shouldn't do that. So what gives away? How do you, if it's not these numbers that's given, how can you tell that these two I should not choose? <laughs> if I change three by four or five, a hundred or zero point one, would I change my conclusion? No, so what is important is the sign of this coefficient, right? If they are positive, then it doesn't make sense to change it. So let's write down. So these two here, they have positive coefficients in the front. So what does it mean? This means if, um, if I um, increase x1 and x4, because I can only increase it, the equal to 0 is the minimum they can get. I'd, and then I see that z will, z increases with it. Is that right? So why do I want to do that? So don't do it. So I will keep them as um, non-basic variables. They should remain 0. That's uh, the minimum. OK. And now, this guy is a little bit different, x5. It has a, a negative number in front of it. In the basic solution, it's 0, and it cannot be less than 0. So if I take x5 bigger than 0, say x5 equals to 1, will it reduce the z value? You will have a minus 2 on the right-hand side. Is that right? So it makes the z value smaller, do we see? So this variable, probably setting it to be 0, is not so good if I want to minimize z. Probably I want to take x5 big, so the z can be smaller. Do we understand this argument here? Right? So let's put down here. So if I increase x5 to make it bigger than 0, and then I see z will, z decreases. Well, that's good. That's what I want to do, right? So this is hinting that what one should do, we should bring x5 into the basic variable, the set of basic variables, because a bigger than 0, x5 seem to be reducing the value of z. Do we see that? So we, now we made a decision. I want to use x5 also as one of my basic variables. And then I need to replace it with someone, isn't that? I can only have a fixed number of basic variables. So here comes the second question. Which one should I replace x5 with? Which one of x2, x3 <coughs> shall be replaced? How do I figure that out? Mm -hmm. Let's see. Let's go back to the canonical form that we have written here. So we are saying that we want to replace one of them between x2 and x3 with x5 as the basic variable. I want to bring x5 in, but x1 and x4, I will still keep them as a non-basic variable because I switch one at a time. Is that right? So after the switch, they will still take value 0 at the basic solution. Is that right? Because they're non-basic variables. OK, so let's try to answer this question. So let's consider the constraint um, in this i here, in that canonical form, and use what we already have. We know that x1 is ba non-basic, it shall still be 0. And x4 
is non-basic and it shall still be zero. And I write out the constraint with x2, x3, and x5 as uh, non-zero stuff and see what that tells me, all right? So now I have the following. If I do that, I just drop the x1 and x4 because they are zero and I copy down the rest. So I have x3 plus 2x5 equal to 6 and x2 plus 3x5 equals to 15. That's what I have, right? Okay, I am going to rewrite it because I'm trying to decide um, which one of them should I replace with x5 and how big because from the argument we have here we see that the bigger the x5 the more the z will decrease is that right but I know probably x5 cannot be arbitrarily large otherwise the minimum will be negative infinity right so for this problem at least okay maybe sometimes that is the case but I need to figure out how big can I choose this x5. So I will move the x5 to the right hand side okay, of both equations. Okay. So the advantages of this is that now I know x3 equals to that and I also know x3 cannot be negative. So I have a constraint eventually on x5. Do we see that? It cannot be very big and negative because if it's 10 and you see x3 becomes negative and that's not feasible. We need to keep the feasibility. Okay, and then same thing here. This has to be bigger than or equal to 0. Is that right? So that put constraint on how big you can choose x5. So let's write this out, these two constraints. The first one would be actually x5 shall be less than 6 over 2, which is 3. And the second one is x5 is less than 15 over 3, which is 5. And they both have to be satisfied. So you're looking for the intersection of these two inequalities, right? So which one is stricter? Less than 3. Is that right? If it's less than 3, it's less than 5. Is that right? So we realize that this one here is stricter. Okay? Which means x5 can be as big as 3, but not bigger than that. Otherwise, this will not be and otherwise x3 will become negative and that's not good okay so let's push to the limit okay so let's now set x5 equals to 3 because that's the largest it can get and that will give me the largest reduction in the z value also right do we agree okay okay if i set that and then i can i can solve these, uh, so solve this here, and I can find the x3 and x2 value. So this will give me x3. If I put x5 to be 3, that's 0. And then x2 will get 15 minus um, 9. That will give me 6, which is bigger than 0, which is good, right? It will be in the feasible region. So, so this computation now suggests a another basic solution, doesn't it? So now I have a basic solution by putting x5 equal to 3 and x3 equals to 0. So I will have the following. So um, basic solution will be the following. So x1 is not changed. And now x2 becomes 6 x3 is 0, and x4 is 0, it's still non-basic, and x5 is 3. I get another solution, 
containing two non-zeros, which is basic, all the others are zero, which is non-basic. So basically what I'm doing is this computation is hinting that now x3 is zero, meaning I should move x3 to a non-basic variable. Right? Because when it, it, it's now set to be zero, that's what the non-basic variables usually take the value from. So are we convinced that this basic solution actually give us smaller z value? Can we figure out the z value at this basic solution? So what will be the z value? So the expression for z is given here, right? Mm -hmm. x1 and x4 are still 0, so the contribution from the first two terms will remain 0. And now x5 equals to 3, so 2 times 3 mm -hmm, plus 21. So I get 21 minus 6, I get 15. So at that basic solution, z now reduced to 15. So it's getting smaller. So it pays to move there. Is that right? So once you made this decision, the next step will be pivoting the system here correspondingly and using x5 and uh, x2 as the basic variable. And then repeat it and check if that's the optimal. And that will have to be continued on Thursday. Any questions? We're OK? All right. Okay, don't forget to